God bless you all in the beautiful name of the King of Kings, our precious our Lord Jesus. Uh, I welcome you this uh, amazing afternoon or evening or morning, depending on where you are around the world, in the name of the King. And I pray that God uh, will glorify himself through this hour in the name of his only Son, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, my Savior, my Lord, my God, in whom all uh, glory and praise is due. Amen. So um, I'm going to um, uh, be teaching you something about mental weakness and, um, and why it's called mental weakness. And uh, it's going to be very profound. I want you to uh, share this as many times as you can. And then uh, I believe that God will move in a special way. Now, um, I'm going to be speaking about the mind and the, and the weakness or mental weakness. Now, as a child of God, you need to understand this. Um, with everything that is inside of you, is that the battle that we fight spiritually always ends up in the mind. Because whoever has the control of the mind can control the physical world. Whoever can control the mind will control the physical world. Why is that? You see, the mind is the most active part of the soul. Your soul is divided into the mind, the will, and the emotions. Now, the mind, you have the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. Now, the subconscious mind is whereby, you know, when you practice, you see, like, um, when you drive, when you're learning to drive, you, you are learning with the conscious mind. But the more you do it, it goes into your subconscious. So even when you're not paying attention to the road, your subconscious is still driving because you're on autopilot. So your mind is the most active part. When you sleep, your conscious mind is turned off, but your subconscious is still on. So when you do affirmations, when you do affirmations and that kind of stuff, you are programming your subconscious mind, which is the most important part of your mind because it, it makes you do things, um, it makes everything you do physically be a reflex. It's you just react because your subconscious mind is already running the show, okay? So Satan understands if it gets a hold of your mind, he gets a hold of your life. Because as a man thinketh, so is he. So when the devil gets a hold of somebody's mind, when people say they have sold their soul to the devil, people don't understand the extent of what that means. It means their mind, their life, will be influenced and controlled by Satan. Satan doesn't gain anything by somebody dying because he has no control of death because even he will be swallowed up by death. I want you to understand that. Satan wants you alive so that he can use, nobody can use the dead. Satan doesn't go to the cemetery and recruit the dead. So it is in Satan's best interest to have you alive. So that he can use you for his evil and wicked will. The moment you die, he has no say in that. It is God's judgment. It's God's time. You pass away. You either end up in the heavens or you end up in the pit. Satan cannot control the people in the pit. People don't understand. Even demons that are in hell, they are tormented. You know the picture that you have of people with pitchforks and all that? It's not like that. They... They end up uh, torment to the souls that are in there because them themselves are also tormented. This is why when Jesus landed in a certain city with his uh, disciples, when they came off the boat, they, wrote, uh, they arrived at the shore, the evil spirits in the man ran to him and they cried out, they said, Son of the living God, what do you want with us? Please, don't send us to the pit. They were begging him not to send them to hell. Even demons don't want to be in hell. Nobody wants to be in hell. Not only human beings, but even devils. So the deception is that, you know, the deception is that um, 
when Satan gets a hold of somebody, he wants to destroy your life. Okay? He wants to destroy life. What does it mean to destroy life? To make your life miserable. But to kill, it's only God who has the power to give life or to take life. Do you understand? Can people die before their time? Yes, but that's a whole different subject. But it is deception. Satan doesn't benefit. He doesn't benefit by taking your life. He wants to use your life. God doesn't benefit whether you're alive or dead because God is, all, is God by himself. He doesn't need anyone. Whether we worship him or not, he's still God. <coughs> Excuse me. Whether we serve him or not, he's still God. He doesn't need anything. He is God. He's all sufficient. But, and there's a but there, but for Satan... He needs vehicles. He needs people. Uh, are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, somebody asked, so why is there a spirit of death following people? The spirit of death, you have to understand death in essence. The word death is to cripple you not to have life. Death doesn't mean to die. It is torment that the devil is after. Are you getting what I'm saying? When I look at somebody and I say there is a spirit of death, it is torment because this person cannot live their life. You see, the people in hell are also alive. Everyone in hell is alive right now. But they are considered the dead because they have no life. They live to be tormented for eternity. They cannot visit anyone. They cannot call anyone. They cannot have company. They cannot enjoy these things. They are alive, but the Bible calls them dead. Why? Because they have no life. There's nothing going on except torment for eternity. But believers, when they pass away, what does the Bible say? They are asleep. Why? Because there is no torment for them. They await the resurrection of their bodies. So Jesus said, we are going to go and wake up our friend Lazarus. Notice Jesus never said Lazarus as the spirit of death. Do you understand? Yet Lazarus was sick unto death. Is this making sense so far? So when people read this, uh, uh, it, says, uh, it says the thief, somebody misquoted scripture. They say, why does it say Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy? No, 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 no. It says the thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come so that they may have life and life more abundantly. This verse is not talking about the devil. It's talking about false shepherds. People who are pretending to be servants of God. Their mission is to steal from you, to kill you, and to destroy you. But Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I lay my life for my flock. The church teaches that as if it is Satan, but that's completely reading the, the, uh, uh, the verse wrong. If you read in context, you'll understand that Jesus is talking about wolf in sheep clothing. Not Satan. Satan is never called, uh, 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 he's called a liar, the dragon. Those are his titles. The thief is talking about a man who comes into church, pretends to be a servant of God, but he's robbing you, stealing from you, and you're not receiving life in abundance. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about Satan. Is somebody understanding this? Let's go, let's go a little bit deeper. So capture this by the Spirit of God. Your biggest battle is not your financial situation. It is not the sickness in your body. It is not the relationships that are falling apart. It is not those who have betrayed you. The goal of Satan is to make you mentally weak. Demons are after your mind. Because if the devil can get a hold of your mind, he will destroy you. 
He can control your life. He can lead your life where he wants it to go. This is what the devil is interested in. The devil is not interested in anything else than your mind. You see, when the Lord Jesus was in the wilderness and he was being tempted, he was being tempted in order to weaken his mind. If you're the son of God, why are you hungry? So that Jesus can say, yeah, why is my father letting me hung be hungry in the wilderness? It was to break him mentally. Why do you need to die for these people? I can just give you the whole world. Just worship me here. Nobody will ever know about it. They were trying to get Jesus. Satan was trying to get Jesus to quit. He was trying to break him mentally. Well, if God really can protect you, Jump off this building. Let's see if he's going to rescue you. In order to put fear into the mind of the Lord Jesus. So what people don't understand is your greatest protection against Satan is to protect your mind. Your mind is the most sacred thing that you can have. Your mind is the most important thing that you have possession over. Even us ourselves, when we deal with psychology, right? You are trained to program yourself for good habits. Why? Because if the mind is not checked, you will start to do things you don't even want to do because the mind has been programmed to do those things. So you fear. You go through all these things because your mental health is not checked. You don't position your mind to understand that spiritual things can affect the mind. It can. So every believer must take their mental health extremely serious. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I have seen Christians in the church have mental illnesses. Simply because you have hyper-spiritualized yourself and you miss the point of how spiritual life is supposed to flow from the Holy Spirit to your spirit to your soul and then to your body. If you claim to walk with the Lord, but your mental state is not okay. You have to know that there is a problem. Let's look at the scriptures real quick. Let's look at some verses. Let's look at some... Uh, let's look at some verses. By the mercy of God, I know the Lord is going to help us. Oh, Lord Jesus. Um, let us go to... Um, I think I wrote it on this one. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, King Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, uh, I forget which phone I put it on. <laughs> Don't judge me, people. Uh, okay, here we go. I think I did it in my mind. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Okay. Go to Second Corinthians, chapter 10. You can start uh, from verse 4. Okay. Second Corinthians 10 from verse 4. Okay, let's hear it. Go. Okay. Uh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, mm -hmm. but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, mm -hmm. casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Notice, so you cannot bind strongholds because strongholds are located in the mind. 
Our weapons of warfare are mighty through God in the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every thought that exalts itself above the word of God. Notice where the problem is. Your fight is not, oh, oh, I pull down every stronghold in the mighty name of Jesus. It's not going to happen. That is why the Bible is saying our weapons, meaning there are different weapons for different things. It's not saying our weapon. Weapons, meaning how I deal with my mental deliverance is different than how I deal with a demonic deliverance in me. How I rebuke a demon out of me and how my mind can be delivered is different. It is not one remedy for all. You see, this is the problem with people who want to do deliverance so bad. They think everything is the same. I want to break witchcraft. I, 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 I want to break witchcraft. I want to break sorcery. I want to break a, a, a generational curse. I want to do this this way. Then you use the same formula for everything. It not go work. It doesn't work like that. It's not the same thing. You have to understand that every single issue has a specific remedy that God has ordained for it. You can't use one solution for it all. It doesn't work like that. I am sorry to tell you, it does not work like that. I plead the blood of Jesus in my mind. No, you didn't get rid of the stronghold. The first effect of a stronghold in the mind is it starts to bring imaginations. You know, most of the things you battle with are just in your mind. How is tomorrow going to turn out? You have already imagined the worst. What is making you imagine the worst? That is a manifestation of a stronghold. I feel like I'm talking to myself. The moment I can start thinking the worst about a situation I don't even know. God took care of me last year. God took care of me 10 years ago. Okay, today I'm going through struggles. You would think the things that God did for me will build mental toughness where I understand that my present suffering will not compare to the glory that is to be revealed. When we say the Lord is my strength and my salvation, we are not talking about physical strength. We are talking about a mental strength. The Lord is my strength. Through anything, I'm fine. If I die, I die. If I live, I live. Are, are you getting what I'm saying? Yeah. There is something that is happening in the mind. You don't fix the mind by prayer. Ah, uh -uh. Prayer is one of the ways, but it's not the way you fix the mind. Haven't you met people who pray that complain the most? Every second. I've just been fighting devils. I've just been, oh, things are just so hard. I just don't know. Why, 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 but Father, I bless you. Uh -uh. You, you see, those two can't go together. Look at an example, Job. Okay? Look at an example, Job. In one second, you can ask me. Look at an example, the prophet Job. <laughs> prophet Esham. <laughs> Think about it like this. Uh, think about it like this. L let me find the best way to put it. I'm looking for a good analogy in my mind. Every single thing, listen to me, children of God. Prayer puts you besides God. It brings you beyond, before God. But your self-image before God is up to you. It's not up to him. You see, if you read Jeremiah, okay, this is what the Lord was saying to Jeremiah. My ear is not dull to hear. My hand is not short to deliver. But your sin have separated you from me, not me to you. Because God is saying, I can hear you. My hand is not short to deliver you. 
but your sin has separated you from me. God is saying, I can reach you, I can hear you, but your sin is what is separating you from me, not me to you. Paul said it like this, I am convinced that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Paul was on the other side of what God was saying. When God was addressing the, 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 the Jews in the time of, uh, um, of uh, Jeremiah, he was talking to them because they were on the other side. You see, how you think of yourself presents you before God. How you think of yourself presents you before God. Maybe I should say that one more time. How you think of yourself presents you before God. If I think of myself like I, 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 I am just worthless and I go before God, God cannot make me of value because I have already believed what I believe. If you're, you see, faith works both ways. Eh? Faith doesn't only work when you think positive. You can be so affirmed in negativity. I will never make it. I will never make it. The moment you begin to see yourself never making it, that's faith. It becomes substance. Is somebody understanding what I'm saying? Is this making sense so far? So as a child of God, right, as one that is called by God, you need to start observing and, and thinking, okay, how is my mental state? Because, you see, if your mental, think about this, there is a correct way to pray and there is the wrong way to pray, right? Right? Yeah. Are, are you, aren't you guys sure? Yes. There is the right way to pray and there is the wrong way to pray. The Bible says you don't receive because you pray amiss, meaning there is the wrong way to pray. Why do people pray the wrong way? It's because your mental state is bad. You see, our confidence as children of God, you see, the people of the world, listen to how the, 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 the Lord uh, tells us. He says, we do not mourn like those who are in the world, right? We don't mourn like those who are in the world. When people die, we do cry, but we don't cry like those who are in the world who have no hope. Why don't they have hope? Because if anybody is in the world and they perish, they go to hell, there's no hope. And hope has to do with the future. Hope, doesn't, hope has nothing to do with uncertainty. Hope has certainty. I know that one day we will see each other again. I know that one day I will make it. That is true hope. Fake hope is, I think it's going to work. Let me just be positive. It means that there is no, it is not solid. The hope that comes from the Holy Spirit is assured. It's an assurance that things are going to be okay. Certainly. Hope, has cert hope is certain. So the world has no certainty. They have no uh, hope because they are in the world. They don't have the Lord. So if they go, they can't make heaven. But for us who are in Christ, we cry because I'm going to miss you. I'm not going to see you for some time. But I will not cry like it's the end because I know one day we will be re reunited in the new Jerusalem. On Mount Zion, we will see each other again. Where there are no graveyards, where there are no funerals, our hope is certain. Is this making sense so far? So now, you need to ask yourself, Am I just praying with my lips? Or do I really take time before the King, before the Lord of glory, to make sure that my mental state is strong? Listen to me, children of God. The Bible says this. 
there is an evil day. Can you find that verse for me, Musa? To withstand the evil day. Every single person on the, in the world, those who love God, those who don't love God, those who have rejected God, those who have backslidden, those who are thinking of backsliding, no matter what the case is, every human being will have an evil day. Every human being will face an evil day. Can you read it for me? Ephesians 6, uh, verse 13, uh -huh. and it reads, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. You see, everybody, everybody, everyone will experience an evil day. Jesus experienced it. Moses experienced it. Jeremiah experienced it. Daniel experienced it. His uh, three friends experienced it. Elijah experienced it. Elisha experienced it. Apostle Paul experienced it. Peter experienced it. James experienced it. It goes on and on and on. John experienced it. Do you know what is the first armor that you need to put on? Helmet of salvation. Your mind needs to be saved. Not just your, your, your body, yes, protected, but your mind needs to be saved. Salvation that you have received must also manifest in your mind. Somebody that has been liberated in the mind, somebody that has put on the helmet of salvation, it doesn't matter what the devil does. Their mental state is different. Satan wants to attack your body. You can kill my body, but you cannot touch my soul or my spirit. The devil tries, you say, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Even Satan will not have anything to attack you because people think the full armor means you will not be touched. The full armor means if you touch me, you see, armor, if you, if you look at like uh, the olden days, right? There are different kinds of armor. You went into battle with a sword and you have an armor on and a helmet on. You went into a sword fight, okay, or arrow. If they shoot you with an arrow, it's just like a bulletproof vest, right? Just because you have a bulletproof vest, it doesn't mean if you get shot, you, it will not hurt. Yeah. Oh, it hurts bad. The bullet won't go through, but you have bruises. I remember when, uh, Charles, when we went shooting, and dad gave me the shotgun. This is a few years ago, the first time I ever shot with, uh, with Pops. And uh, I was given a shotgun. I, but man, I was red all over, bad. Listen, the fact that you have armor doesn't mean you will not, you will not feel it. You will, it just won't kill you. If Goliath had his helmet on, he would have been seriously concussed. <laughs> he would have not died, but he was going to be concussed. Is this making sense? Yes. So what am I trying to say to you? Everybody will have that moment that you will have to choose Christ or deny Christ to save yourself or to avoid problems. Everyone will. God's protection does not begin by us being surrounded with angels. It begins by us fortifying ourselves in God. If you are not standing on the solid rock, God cannot start putting divine protection around you. Because if you only love God because you have an edge of protection then God knows the day that age of protection goes, you will not love him. You will betray him. Why? Because you never loved him. You loved him for the protection. You see, this is what Satan used against Job. He said, Lord, he loves you because you have protected him and you have given him a lot. Take away that protection. Take away the things that you gave him. Let's see if he still loves you. But Job was fortified in Christ. Are you really on the rock?
Are you really on the rock? Every Christian will go through embarrassing moments. Every Christian will go through rejection. Every believer will go through these things. It's part of the journey. Are you listening to me? Daniel chapter 3. From verse 16. Daniel chapter 3 from verse 16. Daniel 3, 16. Mm -hmm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, mm -hmm. O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Mm -hmm. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Notice this. Listen to it. shows you where their mind is. Number one, they said, King, if you throw us in the fire, our God is able to deliver us. Notice they are certain in their God. And they said, and even if he doesn't come for us, you destroy our bodies. We are still with him. But we want you to know something. We will never worship your God. What? We will never, ever, 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 ever worship your God. We won't do that. We will never worship your God. We will not. We will never worship your God. We can't do that. We cannot worship your God. We know God can deliver us, for sure. Think about the furnace burning. They, and you'll, you'll see you're about to be killed. And you're saying, oh, by the way, God can save me from that. There is no hope. Your only hope is just, let me just accept so that I don't die, and then I will go and repent. <laughs> That's how we think. You know what? I'm just going to do this one thing. And then, you know, I'll just tell God, God will understand, man. God, God will be cool. And then, and then it's, it's going to be all right. God will understand. Yes, God will forgive you. But tomorrow Satan will come again and you will betray God again. What if you do that and then you die? Are you really on the rock? For our weapons of warfare. Can you read that one more time? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And that's 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. For, uh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5. Casting down imaginations. The first thing is you have to check the realm of your imagination. When you look at Genesis chapter 6, okay, Genesis chapter 6 talks about the mental state of people in the time of Noah. It says that God was angry with them because he saw that all their imagination the imagination of their heart was continually evil. God was so hurt because of the state and the condition that these people were in. God was so hurt. 
God destroyed everything to start afresh because of man's imagination. If your imagination has become evil, Satan will use you. He's already using you. Because where your thoughts go, your body will follow. Where your thoughts go, your body will follow. I'll say that one more time. Where your thoughts go, your body will definitely, for sure, for real, guaranteed, will and must follow. It's just the way it is. It's terrible, but it's true. It's terrible, 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 but it's true. So now, as you think of all these things, begin to examine your thoughts. What imaginations come to me? Some people are struggling with lustful imagination. Some people are dealing with jealousy in their imagination. Some people are dealing with envy in their imagination. Some people are even killing in their imagination. There's a big time defect in that place. What is the content of your imagination? If your imagination is already on the wrong track, your mind is already weak. Satan can get you. Because we don't resist the devil physically. We resist him over here. You are going to die. You start thinking about your funeral day, the day you'll be buried, how your children will be left. You start panicking and all that. The devil already got you. You're never going to make it. You're just saying, oh, woe is me. Look at my life. It's always going to be like this. It's always going to be like this. Satan already got you. God wants you to cast down imagination. Casting down imaginations. In a little bit, we'll look at how casting down imagination works. Let me ex ask you a question, right? All right? I want you to think about something. Let's, let's do a little experiment. Okay. Um, I want you to imagine your favorite food, right? Everyone, wherever you are, just imagine your favorite food. Nothing negative. Imagine your favorite food. Okay. Yeah. Are you thinking about it now? Can you see it? Are you sure you can see it? Think of yourself eating it and all that good stuff, right? Chandler, did you keep thinking when I called your name or did it stop? Your voice will always pull down your imagination. That is why you can interrupt a thought by speaking. The voice of evil thoughts can be interrupted simply by a voice. This is why when Satan was talking to Jesus, he was not talking to him physically. He was speaking to him here. But whenever Jesus responded, he responded with the word, It is written. If you don't read the word of God, you cannot cast down imagination. So you imagine somebody who gets imagination and says, I, I, I cover myself in the name of Jesus. Bad thoughts, bad thoughts. No, you need to speak. I have the mind of Christ. I think the thoughts of God. 
you open up a scripture, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Immediately that voice will silence. You don't fix it by, I bind, I rebuke. Mm -mm. It's not going to work. <laughs> ah, see how simple it is. Do you realize the word of God was never meant to be read mentally? It was always meant to be spoken audibly. Because the word of God is strong, is powerful, is sharper than a double-edged sword. When you read, the, it's, what does it say? The word of God, can you go to that quickly? Listen to this. Listen to why this can bring down, cast down imaginations, right? Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, read it. For the word of God is quick. This is Hebrews 4, 12. Mm -hmm. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It divides the soul and the spirit. And of the joints and marrow. And the joints and the marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Notice what it's telling you. It's telling you the word of God is so deep. That it will bring a distinction between your soul and your spirit. It will show you what is making those, what is joining. Them. It's not talking about your physical joints. It's talking about what is actually causing it to happen or to go that direction. And it will tell you the intention and the thoughts of the mind. So no word of God, you may not even know why you're thinking the way you're thinking. When the word of God starts entering you, it starts bringing a distinction. You start knowing, ah, uh, I used to think this is the right way to think. Now I know that's not how I'm supposed to think. As a child of God, why am I, th whoa, my thoughts have gone far from God. My heart has gone far. F why was I even thinking like that? You know, we all had those moments where we used to think that this is right, this is wrong, this is, and then you get to a place where you hear a sermon, you start realizing, hmm, <laughs> dang, I really thought that was right. What the heck was wrong with me? Oh my God, you start correcting yourself. You start checking yourself. You start looking and you're like, ah, oh, man. Thank God for the word of God. Why? Because revelation opens your eyes. You see, many of you just listening to these messages, you're already delivered because you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Not you shall know the truth, then you will pray and then you'll be free. You shall know the truth and natural, when the truth enters you, Immediately you are free because the shackles Satan could use cannot hold you anymore. Yeah. Is this making sense so far? Yes. Our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God in the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination. Uh -huh. What's the next verse? And it... And as it finishes, and every th high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. You see, knowledge is still mental. So you need to ask yourself, what knowledge do you have? You see, when Job, his family died, his properties were taken away. Everything is gone bad. The reason why he never turned against God is because he had knowledge concerning God. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked will I go back. So the first thing is that my children were never mine anyway. The things I have were God's anyway. They are not mine. Then the next thing he said, praise be the name of the Lord. He went on his knees and worshipped. Why did he do that? He knew that God is in control of it all. Even if he takes it, it is his. Yes, I love my children, it's painful, but they belong to him. I was just privileged to give birth to them, to conceive them, but they're not mine. I don't have ownership of them. I don't own them. His knowledge kept him because there was no protection from God. Whenever God wants to lift you, he will allow you to be tempted, but not beyond what you can bear. 
and he will provide a way out. The way out provided is what he already gave you. And if you pass the test, you upgraded both spiritually and physically. What is your mental condition? Getting ready to fight your brother and sister is not mental toughness. Loudness, shouting is not strength. If anything, it shows weakness. A calm and quiet spirit is strength. True strength. That no matter what is happening, there's just calm. Again, I ask you, sincerely, truthfully, and calmly, what is your mental state? This is, you see, let me explain something that will help you. It says this about the Lord Jesus. Let this mind be in you. I was also in Christ Jesus. Being made in the image of God, he saw it not robbery to be equal with God. There is a certain way Jesus' th thoughts worked. Even though he took the form of a servant, his God nature was not deemed because of the flesh. But the Bible is telling you, let this mind that was in Christ Jesus be in you. It means Jesus adapted a certain mindset. Mm. That when he faced the cross, he was fine. When he faced tribulation, he was fine. Do you have the mind of Christ? It's not a declaration. It is a way to form thinking. What is in your life that is exalting itself above the word of God? What is in your life that is exalting itself above the word of God? Is it the doctor's report? Is it where your marriage is? Is it where your children are? Is it your financial condition? What is going on that is lifting itself above the word of God? And what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? I know of men of God that killed themselves because they felt so much pressure. Mm. That should never be our portion. I know men and women of God that quit working for God because they were persecuted. That should never be our portion. I know people who turned away from God because some people represented Jesus the wrong way. Were you really saved? Did you give your life to Jesus because of your brother or your sister or did you give it because you know that salvation comes from him and that he is God? What are you doing about it? What are we doing about it, children of God? This is serious. Listen, this is a serious, serious thing. It's not, a, it's not like an easy thing. One of the things that my mother taught me, is she gave me a way to build myself. And I thank God that through everything I've ever gone through life, God has kept my heart. I can't take credit for it, but God did get a hold of my heart and God did keep me. Because we went through it, boy. Ooh, hoo, hoo, crazy.
crazy. Before I give you what you can do to start building, I want you to truly examine yourself. Truthfully, genuinely. Truthfully and genuinely. Stop hiding yourself behind false spirituality. Stop hiding yourself behind false spirituality. Stop hiding yourself be, be behind, oh, I'm a child of God. No, face these things head on. You can't get healed if you, if you are hiding things. You can't get God's salvation in that way. You cannot. I'm sorry. You just can't. God has called us not to run away from problems, but to face them. If you cannot genuinely look at yourself and say, hey, truthfully, Lord, uh, I am messing up in this area. He want, you know what, Lord, I am definitely missing it in this area. If you can't do that, you're in big trouble. You will always pretend and pretend and pretend, but you're dying inside. You see, in third world countries, you find most believers being very strong. Not because they pray so much. They have gone through, through so many trials, they've realized that, you know what? No matter what, God is still good. They're able to survive it. Evangelist team, God bless you, my brother. I hope your wife and baby are well. Just, just think about that. They've gone through so many tribulations that they are just like, you know, it is what it is. They love God more. But you come to a place where people have had everything easy. If they go through troubles, they fall apart. I am going to tell you how to fix this thing in two seconds. It will not be a da da ba da ba da it's an exercise that you have to do sincerely, truthfully, dedication to it will change your spiritual life completely. Amen. It will shift your work with God completely. You know, many times as believers, we cater to our salvation, but we don't cater to the entire deliverance of our being. You don't only get deliverance from de demons. You should be delivered also from your old life, from your old thinking, your old ways. Amen. The absence of a demon does not mean you're still bound. You're, it does not mean you're still not bound. When a live, demon leaves you, he still left a culture with you. If you continue in it, you're still bound. Amen. Let's say a demon came in your life and he taught you how to steal. The demon left. Believe you me, every time you need something so bad and you can't get it, you resort to what the devil taught you, how to steal. Then you say, you know, I'll just steal this one time. God is not, God will be, because he taught you a way and whatever you're taught is still programmed in you. Yeah, <laughs> this is the truth. Um... So we are going to carry on with things that my mother taught me, right? This helped me greatly. The first thing is this. You see, the pro book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom. Okay. Proverbs, there are three books that I think you should visit a chapter from each book every day. Apart from your regular reading. Three. Proverbs, Psalms, Ecclesiastics. These are like mental health and spirit strengthener, these three. 
Proverbs will teach you things like uh, a quiet answer driveth away anger. Lantush. Psalms will teach you of lamentation, how to cry to God, how to present yourself before God, how to worship God. Some of the Psalms will even teach you not to envy other people because when, you, when I envied them, this is what happened. It's people's cries before God. Ecclesiastics is about the wisest man on the earth telling you, listen, man, this is how you need to live your life. I had it all. I had everything. I did everything. And life comes down to these three things. These three books will change this. A chapter a day of this will change your life. Just the consumption of God's word will change you, but this one, your perspective will change. Number two, those who are on Rome, uh, realms of meditation, that have uh, subscribed to my website, I have a, pres uh, I have a daily devotional and, and uh, also a meditation thing that I, a guided meditation that is very, very powerful on the Word of God, that is also on my website. It's incredible. Um, you can visit uh, PowerShot. Is it called Daily PowerShot or PowerShot? I don't even know my power. Daily PowerShot. Daily PowerShot. It's incredible. You need to visit it. It's a, it's a, it's a different thing altogether. It's amazing. If I was you, I would subscribe. Another thing is this. You have to be able to imagine the worst time or the worst, worst thing you can go through and see God delivering you from it. And I will explain in a second. You have to be able to sit down and imagine the worst situation you can be in and still see God delivering you. Let me explain to you why the mind is very dangerous. The mind cannot tell the difference between what is real and what is fake. Because your soul doesn't live in the material world. And neither does it live in the spiritual world. It lives in between. So it cannot tell the difference. It can't. So what you imagine, there's an experiment they did in a, in with two uh, uh, teams playing basketball. They were all professionals. There was a group that was being made to meditate, shooting like hoop, like uh, shooting their shot, right? Uh, for one week, all they did is meditated, seeing themselves shooting the basketball. And the other team was made to practice shooting the basketball. When they went to actually have them do a shoot-off, the ones who meditated were better than the ones who are doing it physically. Because physically you can be going through the motions, but it takes a certain mental capacity for you to actually do it. The aim is not in the body, it's actually here. Huh? If you want to know a good boxer, it's not somebody who hits mitts. Everyone can look good on that. Let's shadow box and imagine you're in a fight. If you can do that with intent, you're ready to fight. That's why people watch film. Some of the greatest athletes, whether no matter what the sport is, they always watch tape. Because if they can see it mentally, they will do it physically. If you have never sat down and thought of the worst day and you can see Jesus saving you from that place. When that thing happens physically and you've never done it, you will crash. But if you have already put yourself mentally in that place and you saw deliverance, when it comes physically, your mind will not panic. We've been here before, we are fine. We'll make you through it. Remember God saved us. Because your soul cannot tell the difference. It cannot tell the difference. This is how also you built up faith.
So I hope this helps you. Father, I pray for your people. May these words enter our heart. May we be changed forever. May we resemble your son Jesus in every way. Lord, we thank you that we are free, not only from evil spirits, but also from the bondages that the mind has received throughout life. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you are so good, you are so kind, and you are so gracious unto us. May your name be lifted now and forever in the beautiful and powerful name of your only Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, I love you all. May the Lord Jesus keep you and bless you. Bye-bye.